Cincinnati's Rock Legends continues on Star 64. Originally, the first time ever we ever sang together, some of us, we were at a hop at Castle Farms. And uh, I think Bob Smith, the CPO, was just jockeying at the hop. And we were in the back there singing, and somebody said, man, you ought to get a group together. And that's really how it started, that's simple. And then you change people, and you meet other guys, and people come in and out, and so you get the nucleus from what you want. I mean, you know, we made a living, a good living, uh, way before we ever had a hit record. I mean, we were playing like maybe the Playboy Club at night and had a TV show during the day. We used to do the Inner Circle, uh, now Bogarts. We used to do that six nights a week. Right. We opened up the Tiki Club and played at the Touche and Black Stallion, Black Stallion yeah. which is now Annie's. Guys and uh, Dolls. Locally, guys and Dolls. <clears throat> we were over to the Lookout House and played the Old Flamingo when Newport was going. I mean, Playboy Club. And we had several records out, uh, regional records that hit on WSAI here and hit, hit in Columbus and Pittsburgh before we ever had the big hit. We went in and just basically, uh, so I think it was like a regular standard three and a half, four hour right. uh, recording session. And we knocked out four, four tunes in that session. And um, then you can tell me Dubai was one of them. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, they released the record in December, the worst time of the year. Everybody said, you can't do it then. This thing was a hit by January and February. It was just, like, like we're saying, it consumed us all before we knew what we were doing. When I recollect about that time, I was just getting out of college. Uh, from Xavier University in the day. Um, and uh, of course, most of the time when we were recording and playing, I was going to school at the same time. So I was I was just not aware of this. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like uh, Gene Call says, we're going on the road, you know, it's gonna happen, you know, another month and a half, we're gonna be leaving. We're playing really? clubs six nights a week. And, uh, and it's all consuming. Yeah, and all of a sudden you just, uh, we got to get a bus and we're, we're, we're going to be gone. You it's know? like a monster. It just starts taking your life over. You know, you don't really control your life. You really don't. Because they want you to do this, they want you to get a record, but they want you to be here to make the money. And you got you to gotta get on the road. And that's why, you know, I, I'm sorry. I've just never been proud of our album because that was a rush deal. Where we had to rush in because we were working so much on the road. And none of us ever really liked that album. Didn't even know what the next single was. We were driving back from a gig one time I heard on the radio here. <laughs> called, it was called It's All Over. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in about a year, hitting that road and the tires we all were and confused, we all wanted off the road and away from each other as far as we could get. <laughs> and that's not blaming anybody. That's just the way it was. I mean, really, if we had a hit record today, you know how much better we would handle something like this? We'd, we'd plan. We'd, we'd know what we were doing. More mature. I mean, that was just too confusing. I never want to go through a time like that in my life again. The casinos were together about 15 years off and on. You know, we'd take little breaks and rest and come back and get together, but I, about 15 years. And I'll tell you one thing, though, know, out of all the groups of people around this town, I don't think anybody had more fun, played more clubs, and had more fun than we had. Yeah. <laughs> really and truly. I mean, we played every major nightclub here, every tour that come by. I mean, we really had it made. King Records had only one major rival in Cincinnati, Fraternity Records. The Fraternity label included stars like Bobby Bear, Lonnie Mack, and the Casinos. The label was founded by Harry Carlson. For years, he was a big, big portrait studio in the United States. I mean, known all over the United States. Some of the famous people came here to have their portraits done by Harry Carlson. In fact, the official portrait in the Senate of Robert Taft was one Harry done. And Harry had always been a songwriter and fooled with music, and, that's, and he evolved into the music thing. Well, he had an office, but it was, in, it was his hotel room. He lived in the Gibson Hotel, and that was his office, too. Part of it was the office, and the back part was the bedroom they were in. Well, Harry, we always called Harry the gentleman gentleman. He was so slow and so laid back, and he, he looked like Arthur Creature, who was always a butler in the old movies. He used to, well, he moved into the Sheraton Gibson Hotel, and he had his own suite there, and he, I think they'd give it to him just to have him there because he was that type of guy and everybody loved him. And I really, really liked Harry Carlson. I, I more than like, I loved Harry Carlson. I loved his wife, Louise. Him and Louise had no children, so these were like the children, or our artists on the way. Like I say, Harry became like a father to me and he thought of me and so did his wife, Louise thought of me and my family as their, as their children. We went on to be best friends, and 
Matter of fact, I named one of my boys after him. My uncle put together Harry Dolls. And see, here's a man that in those days, most groups and people who were artists never got the role. He overpaid us. I mean, if you need any money, he wouldn't done it, you yeah. know? And that was real rare in those days. Harry and Louise Carl Carlson were just real good human beings. And you don't find that many, especially in the record business and show business. There was never anything out of place. Every was, shirt was white and immaculate. I mean, just starched like, and yeah. yeah, just as she had said. A suit just, at all times. Usually blue, usually a dark blue suit, red tie or something. And that, you know, I just, I still have this picture of Harry. It's I've just, never seen him without a tie. No, no, never no, in my life. Gene Hughes can do the best impression of Harry Carlson than anybody in the world. If you ever see Gene, say, Gene, do me a Harry Carlson. Oh, Ray, it's so good to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Louise and I were just thinking about you. Those are children. <laughs> yeah, that's her. He nailed them all off. You know, everyone, I'll never forget their name. Yeah. Louise, push Ray a drink. <laughs> Harry used to exaggerate. And I love people exaggerate. He did it better than anybody in the world. He would call up when we were on the radio. He'd say, Shad, Harry. Harry, how you doing? Shad, I just cut the greatest record since the history of man. Lonnie, Mac, Chad, they're screaming in the streets for this record. That was one of his favorite sayings. But Sid Nathan, uh, I don't know how well this is known, but it's true, Sid Nathan called Harry one time, wanted to know how come everybody in the world loved Harry and hated him, and how could he be more like Harry Carlson? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to change his image. Harry died in his 81, but there are some people in my life that I think should live forever. There really is. I think Chet Adkins is a real dear friend. I think he should live forever. I think uh, Shel Silverstein should live forever. I'm talking about my people that I love with all my heart. And Harry Carlson is definitely a man who, who should, should live forever. In 1975, Harry Carlson sold the fraternity label to Shad O'Shea. Fraternity Records remains one of the oldest continually operated independent record companies in America.